Well, I don't know if I'll be able to come up with a football uh, uh, illustration and lead off next week because I think there's a little game being played somewhere uh, next Sunday afternoon. But uh, um, on a 2010 website for the Chicago Bears, there's a, there was a video clip for a while of Coach Lovey Smith, who's a believer, uh, and he's giving his spiel to all of the rookies coming in trying to make the team. And of course, these are guys that started playing Pop Warner, you know, at seven or eight or nine. And, made the cut and finally went on and played high school, got a scholarship, played college somewhere and, and made uh, really what they uh, anticipated would be their dream to get into the NFL. Uh, and then the reality there that uh, more than half of them will get cut before the team is whittled down. They start with 80, a few weeks later they cut it to 65 before the season starts. It's gotta be down to 53. That year of the 19 rookies, uh, seven actually made, uh, made the team by the time they had, uh, had opening day. And Coach Smith said, uh, said this to, the, to them. He said uh, uh, that make sure you make us put you on the team. Uh, in other words, you go out there and excel in such a, tr a way is that we can't help but want to have you on, a, on our football team. Don't sit back and wait for the coaches to select you. You, you take the thing in your own hands. In the video, he put it this way, make us put you on the team. In other words, play so well in practice that the coaches couldn't imagine cutting you. Make us put you on the team. Take the decision out of the coaches' hands. Let your performance make the decision for us. And unfortunately, that's the way we look at our relationship with the Lord sometime. As though he's saying, <coughs> your performance is what gets you a relationship with me and keeps you in a relationship with me and even... Uh, uh, some would even think gets them into heaven one day. You know, you perform. You make it so. You take the decision out of my hand. <laughs> but uh, God's not saying that to us. We find the opposite to be true, that our relationship with him is, is never, will never be based on our, our performance or what we do. And, well, Jacob's a classic example. We've already seen it with his father. We've seen it with his grandfather. And uh, so often in the Bible, God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus used that phrase many times. It's how God reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush. Uh, who are you? I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's, it's my desire that by the time we get to the end of Genesis and get to chapter 50, that when we hear that phrase, we'll, we'll, what will come to our mind is <clears throat> we'll almost chuckle thinking about Abraham and thinking about Isaac, and thinking about Jacob, and all their blunders, and all the dumb decisions, and all the things that they did, but man, God was so gracious, God was so faithful. The God that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of all grace, and, uh, and we're going to see that again this, this morning. Well, let's take a look again. This scene uh, we kind of, uh, kind of edged into at the end of the last chapter. Esau has become so upset over the idea that Jacob has received the blessing instead of him, even though it was by, by trickery <coughs> and by deception, that uh, he's infuriated and now uh, basically says, I'm going to kill Jacob. I might not do it when, when dad's alive. I don't want to grieve him any further, but sooner or later, I'm going to kill my brother, my twin brother, for, uh, for doing this. Then you've got Isaac who basically has come to the realization, and we'll look at that verse that we tried to point out last week in verse 33, that uh, when Esau comes in, brings the meal, and hears his voice, he realizes he's already blessed someone else, that is the younger, that God has had his way, that God has orchestrated the events, and his rebellion against God and wanting to have his way and do his thing has brought him to nothing. He's pretty much scared to death at that point. In verse 33, we tried to show there was some real repentance because when Esau says, well, bless me, don't you have any bless blessing for me? And he says, no. At this point, I'm not going against God. You know, your younger brother was supposed to get it. He got it. He's supposed to have it. And there's some real repentance. We're going to see that uh, uh, lived out here in this chapter in the first five verses. And then, of course, you've got Rebecca who realizes that uh, it's no empty threat. Isaac will kill Jacob. I better get Jacob out, out of here. I'll send him back to my family in Padan Aram so he can find a wife there because after all, Esau has married two Canaanite gals and they're a continual grief to us, she says. Uh, and that's going to come up again in these verses as well. well. Let's look at verses 1 to 5. Isaac's repentance is seen in the blessing. 
Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to your and your, your descendants with you that you may inherit the land <coughs> in which you were a stranger which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Padan Aram to Laban the son of Bethuel the Syrian the brother of Rebekah the mother of Jacob and Esau. First thing we know about this repentance and why we call it that is there's the command to take a wife uh, from the house of, of Bethuel. It begins, then Isaac calls Jacob and he blesses him. He's already done that one time, now he's going to bless him again. He realizes that Rebekah's suggestion is the right one, that uh, he knows his son Esau well enough that this is not a veiled threat. He better get him out of him. But there's something greater. He is the, going to be the third patriarch. He is going to be uh, the one to whom the covenant promises all go, go to. That's what God said. He has repented. He sees it. He's going along with it. And, uh, and so what we need to do is make sure we spare him the opportunity to blunder by taking a wife from a Canaanite, which again brings in all of their, it's not that they weren't good cooks or anything. It's just, you know, they're out worshiping all the false idols and so forth, and they don't want that spiritual pollution into their lives. And so let's, let's preemptively make sure that that doesn't happen. Are there some things we can do to preemptively prevent us from sinning? <laughs> there, there are a lot of times. And these guys are, he's going to use some common sense at this point. Uh, it's for more than just the reason of fleeing from Esau. It's so that he'll marry the right, the right person and not become uh, unequally yoked. Again, verse 33 of chapter tw uh, 27 is where we first saw this uh, key repentance on Isaac's part. Then Isaac trembled, notice trembled exceedingly when he realized what had happened and said, uh, who, where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him. Indeed, he shall be blessed. There's nothing I can do about it at this point. I think that's the key turning in Isaac's life. Indeed, he shall be blessed. There's a repentance and now there's a submission uh, to God's, uh, God's will. And, uh, and of course, the reminder at the end of that chapter, Rebecca says, remember Isaac, Esau has taken two Canaanite wives already. And, uh, and therefore, Jacob, who will be the bearer of the covenant, uh, let's send him away. And Isaac's saying, absolutely. He is the bearer of the covenant. Uh, this is the right thing to do. Uh, so secondly, the repentance is seen in the command to uh, take the wife, don't take one of these wives, neg on a negative sense, take one of these instead. And, um, and so there's an acknowledgement that he is going to be the one that uh, receives the Abrahamic covenant. Verse 3, he says, may God Almighty bless you. <coughs> That's the term El Shaddai, which uh, again, this name that God uses for Abraham in chapter 17, when he reaffirms the covenant to Abraham and says uh, that... Uh, I'll bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you, gives them the land, the promise, the blessing, the Messiah, and then gives them the sign of that covenant, which would be circumcision. And now Isaac draws from that a covenant name when he pronounces this blessing upon, uh, upon Isaac uh, or on Jacob. So Isaac's come around. So we were, uh, if, um, uh, we were, uh, if we were in our minds and our hearts, booing Isaac for a while for his rebellion against God, which we didn't really do out loud, but uh, uh, we'd be cheering him now because he's come around. Do you like it when your heroes do stuff right <laughs> and you, it really bums you when they do stuff, stuff that's bad? And um, it's certainly that, uh, that's true in, uh, uh, you know, with uh, so much of the world around us today. But it's, it's great when they do something right. Isaac's back in submission, walking with the Lord. So secondly, then you've got, because of his repentance, this is all noted and seen and heard, apparently, by Esau. So Esau will attempt reconciliation through a marriage, verse 6. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there, and that he has blessed him and gave him a charge, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother, 
and had gone to Padan Aram. Also Esau saw the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of uh, Nebaioth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. So Esau will uh, marry a descendant of Ishmael, hoping for reconciliation. Now, you know, some of the writers I read said that, no, I think he did this just to tick his father off a little more. But uh, if he did that, wouldn't he just marry a Canaanite? I mean, he's already, there's an acknowledgement there that I married a Canaanite, and this really grieved my father. I want to really get him. I'm doing it again. But he doesn't. <laughs> so he goes to uh, his, his uh, older stepbrother, Ishmael, uh, and Mary, Mary's now a third wife. But, you know, this is Big Red, you know, the living beer commercial guy. The guy, he, he's trying to do something here, but he just can't figure out how to do it. He's trying to, like, connect the dots. Doesn't want me to marry a Canaanite. Okay, I'll marry one of these other gals. I'm sure this will work out awesome. But, he, you know, but it, it doesn't. Uh, by the way, Esau, you know, they had to kick Hagar out and Ishmael. They're not on great terms. I realize you're related to them. But he can't figure all this out. And, uh, but there appears to be in the unspiritual, immoral Esau uh, an attempt to do something to gain back the relationship that he has lost with his father. He was the favored growing up, which there shouldn't have been any favors. Uh, the assumption was on his part, he could probably, whatever happened, didn't matter what he did, how he lived, how immoral he was, how much he grieved his parents. When push came to shove, his dad was going to give him the blessing, and it just didn't happen. There's some attempt at reconciliation, though I think probably fairly unsuccessful. Uh, thirdly, as we get into the story of, uh, of the ladder from heaven itself, there's going to be a recognition that God's presence was in this dream from Jacob as he now has left. Verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and, uh, and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and, to, and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. It's quite a pronouncement. The uh, recognition of God's presence is really the, uh, the point of the whole dream. That God appears to him. God says this and so forth. Uh, we have the is issue of the ladder. The angels ascending and descending. But the point of the thing is that God shows up to minister to Jacob at this point. And two things about the dream. <clears throat> one is that Jacob is profoundly alone at this point. There is really no one he can, uh, he can talk to. He's exhausted. He's probably despondent. <laughs> uh, I've actually seen guys go to sleep and use a rock for a pillow before <laughs> some of our camping trips but, with the guys. But, uh, uh, so it does happen. He just lays down and he's, uh, he's out. Uh, he may have remembered the good words that his father said to him. Uh, but he probably was wondering whether they would really happen, whether it was really true or not. I mean, he's saying, you're going to have the land, he, but he's leaving the land. You're going to have many descendants. He doesn't even have a wife. This is all kind of a stretch for, uh, for Jacob uh, at, this, at this point. The second thing was he was not only profoundly alone, he was in a certain place. Notice that in verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba, went towards Haran, and he came to a certain place, a particular place, in the Hebrew, there's a uh, pronoun there. It's the place. He came to the place. And we'll know later, as we see his reaction, he names it Bethel. So that tells us a lot. It used to be called Luz. Now it's going to be called Bethel. Jacob's the guy that names it. Now, Moses in his writing has referred to it several times. It's a particular place. We first find it in Genesis 12, 8. When Abraham, his grandfather, first comes into the land, it says, and he... He moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. That's the place. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the right. 
And there he built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. Now, remember when we were there, this was epic, because Abraham comes in, he finally makes it. You know, God calls him out of uh, Ur of the Chaldeans and uh, says, follow me, leave your family, you know, I'll take you in line, I'm going to bless you. Well, he didn't really leave his family, he took a lot of them with him, uh, and he didn't really make it all the way where God got him to. He got up to Haran and went, looks pretty good here. Uh, stays there till his father's Terah dies, and sometime later, finally, finally makes it into the land. And uh, so he finally gets there, not doing too well so far in this faith journey. He's batting 300. He's one out of three uh, for what God asked him to do. But when he gets into the land, then uh, he gets it together. He builds an altar. He calls in the name of the Lord. And we talked about that word call means proclaim. He's proclaiming God's righteousness and his goodness and so forth and how he led them there. So this is a, a very important place. It's the place. It's a certain place. Chapter 13, verse 2 of Abraham, it says, Abraham was very rich in livestock and, and silver and gold. And he went on his uh, journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And what a coincidence that Jacob just happens to stay here for this night at the place where he has this uh, incredible uh, dream as God appears to him uh, and speaks to him and, uh, because he was such a righteous guy. No, not really. Remember, he's the liar, deceiver, on the run, been in sin, not really sure how things are going to work out. And the last thing he's thinking is God's going to show up. If God shows up, he's probably going to beat him ahead with a stick. He's not going to show up and say, I just want to tell you that I'm with you, man, wherever you go. I don't care where you go. I'm going with you, and I'm going to take care of you. And you know those promises that are coming to you? Every one of them is going to happen. Whatever happens, you remember I'm with you and I'm bringing you right back here again, man. Blessings on you. See, Jacob just wasn't thinking that. And I don't know if you're like that. If you do things you shouldn't do, you're, you, you know you're blowing it in your relationship with the Lord. You're kind of on the run for God. When God shows up, you're probably not just thinking he's going to come up and say how much he loves you and cares about you. And, but that's grace. Uh, and that's what we see certainly in the lives of Abraham, of Isaac, and that's what we see with, uh, with Jacob here. So we'd say, secondly, the recognition of God's presence, just his being there, is a statement of, of grace. Notice, notice that it's, it's Jehovah God, or we would say God the Father, speaking from above the ladder, speaking down. All the terms have to do with the covenant, and he is saying that indeed Jacob would be the third patriarch. He's saying he'd become the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, and now he takes these divine terms and these promises uh, and applies them to Jacob himself. And uh, it could not be what he was expecting at all. Ken Hughes says this about the scene. Jacob, the conniving believer, <laughs> we'll give him believer, conniving believer, who was an outcast and alone due to his own sin, who merited nothing from God, was met by God in his misery, with an unparalleled revelation of God's care and assurance for the future. Jacob was not seeking God. He was fleeing the consequences of his deception. He was not expecting grace, but grace was unleashed upon his soul. And not even a word of reproach. The vision and the voice of God only bore assurances. I mentioned that before, you know, we like to have fun with Jacob and referred to him as Dirty Sneaky Thief, but you know, we now know that that title is actually one his brother gave him. Uh, but at the same time, he's far from being a, a perfect guy. But we never find a rebuke. We never find a reproach coming from God. Every time God shows up in Jacob's life, it's like he's there to like bring him along. You know? And even when he's at his worst and he's at his conniving, when we see God show up, it's never a reproach. It's never a rebuke. It's just always, hey, hey, I'm right here. You know, I'm still with you. Uh, we're still going in the right direction. Follow me. And, uh, and certainly, I believe that, that most of the time, that's what God is saying to us. By the time Jacob returns from Padan Aram 20 years later, he could have written these words. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. That's how Jacob gets home. 
by the way, John Newton, the former slave trader, writes that in 1779. Uh, the way that Jacob survives is by God's grace. The way he gets back into the land, remember even at that time, though incredibly wealthy, because God blessed him. He's probably still thinking it was because he was such a smart businessman. It was really because God had blessed him. And even at that point, he's worried about his brother killing him, but it's not going to happen. And uh, you're going to be kind of shocked and amazed at some of the crazy stuff that, that him and his boys go through in the process of when he finally is uh, in his life totally submitted to the Lord. But uh, at this point, it's amazing. God's presence is a statement of grace itself. Now, God's presence is certainly seen in the latter. The Lord confirms the promise through this dream. Uh, Jacob can never go anywhere beyond God's keeping. Uh, and basically what he is saying to him in this dream is that uh, <clears throat> the angels are ascending and descending. Jacob, my, my angels that are ministering spirits are going to be coming to you and from you wherever you go. I'm going to go with you wherever you go and bring you back again. So in other words, this is not a one-time occurrence. The ladder's going with you, the angels are going with you, and I'm going with you uh, all the way. That's really the significance of, uh, of the dream. Always a ladder, always angels, always God. Uh, the last thing is that their recognition of God's presence is seen in the promise of the covenant. And he goes through, uh, again, what we said, these covenant terms. There's the right to the land, verse 13. The land on which you lie, I will give to your descendants. Acknowledges that you're still a stranger, you're still a pilgrim, but it's going to come to your descendants at some point in time in the future. The reproduction of the descendants, verse 14. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. The redemption of mankind. And in you and your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And, and again, we've pointed out many times that when he says, and your seed, it's singular. And we know that from Paul's writing, to the church in Galatia in chapter 3, verse 16, where he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say into seeds as of many, but as of one into your seed who is Christ. Through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the seed, the Messiah would come. He would be the one that would be the blessing to all the nations of the world because he would die for the sins uh, of all the world. The, uh, the fourth thing is the return to the land. Verse 15, I'm with you and I'll keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. The reassurance of God's presence, for I will not leave you the reliability of the promise until I have done what I have spoken to you. So uh, God, in a sense, we would some, some writers would say, you have this ladder or literally, uh, if you want to know literally in the Hebrew, it's more like a staircase. Most artwork and Christian artwork, and there's even some uh, three-dimensional artwork on the outside of some Gothic cathedrals have Jacob's ladder, and it's a ladder going straight up, and the angels are trying to get up and trying to come down, but it's literally the idea of a, of a staircase, so it is true there is a stairway to heaven, but uh, <clears throat> it's not the one sung about by, uh, by Led Zeppelin. Now, this is interesting because there is a truth in that. Uh, there is a stairway to heaven, and... Uh, I've got a, uh, got a, well, a friend of mine, he made, oh, Daddy Lehman. Those are one of the things that, that the Lord used to really get to his um, acid-eaten-out LSD brain, from which uh, if you met him today, he wouldn't remember you the next day. Mind, uh, living there in uh, Santa Cruz, California, is that if there was a stairway to heaven, how do you get on that stairway and how do you know God? Now, that's true. The lie in the song is that uh, there's time to choose. You don't have to choose now. There's plenty of time. But the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Nobody knows when they get another shot, if they get another shot. It says if you hear the gospel, God's been working in your heart, respond now. Don't think, I'll put it off. But uh, that's part of the, uh, the message in the song. <laughs> I had to go back and Google and read the lyrics. And it's pretty strange lyrics, you know. It's uh, interesting, the songs that become popular. I'm sure people were listening to them going, Hey, well, man, that's heavy. Like, what does that mean? I don't know, man. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, it's funny, the, uh, uh, the stuff that we listen to when we're, well, if people are still listening to it. Uh, uh, you like that song? I'll say to my nephew sometimes. Yeah, do you like that song? Are you, do you understand what they're saying in, in the lyrics? No, I just kind of like the sound. Uh, and it's like, 
I'll make a few comments about the lyrics. I don't think that's really good for you to be listening to those lyrics. I mean, they're saying actually some pretty horrible things. Really? It's like, but uh, anyway, that's another subject. But uh, there is a stairway to heaven. And it's God the Father who's at the top giving this message to, to Jacob, completely un, undeserving. Let's take a look at his uh, reaction, and we'll see how shocked he really is. Verse 16, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had uh, put at his head, set it up as a pillar, poured oil on top of it, and he called the name of that place Bethel, or the house of God. But the name of the city had been loose previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So uh, in terms of the reaction, there are several statements he makes. One is that uh, the acknowledgement uh, that God was in that place. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. The idea that I did not know it is that the Lord is in this place, and I'm kind of really confused about this whole thing. I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't even know. I mean, I couldn't know. I wouldn't have conceived of, of what has just, just happened uh, to me. He's in God's presence, uh, and he's more than a little concerned about it because he says he's afraid. Verse 17, and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? Now, we've, we've kind of taken that word awesome and put it in our contemporary vocabulary and made it equal to the word uh, wonderful, like he's wonderful. That was my, one of my new Japanese words on this last trip, sogoi, wonderful, awesome. And uh, I would hear people say that. What does that word mean? They keep saying that. But uh, uh, Old King James kind of helps us. Verse 17, it says, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? There's a dread. There's a fear. There's a reverence. You stand in God's presence. I mean, every time we, we see it, uh, people are, are shaking and trembling when they realize, you know, where they are and what's, uh, what's uh, going on in front of them, that they're in front of a holy in a righteous God. And, and Jacob is afraid. Hey, God is really here. God was really present. So I'm going to call this place the house of God. And uh, I'm kind of freaked out about this whole thing. I'm trying to take it all in. But one thing's for sure, I'm afraid of, uh, of what has just transpired here. But the spiritual truth is, again, that the house of God, and he will make this phrase, the gate of heaven, coexist together in this particular place for him. Uh, the reaction includes setting up an altar now, a lot of times we see in the Old Testament that some event would take place and they would remember it by setting up what's referred to sometimes, at least the archaeologists use the term, a standing stone. Uh, when the children of Israel are going to come into the land with Joshua across the Jordan River, remember God holds the water up and, uh, and they walk through on dry ground. They get to the other side. Joshua says, take one stone for, for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, stack them on top of each other. It'll be a monument. It'll be a memorial. So we can remember God's faithfulness that what has happened here. That's not a bad thing to do to have some of those mental monuments or standing stones in our own lives to remember when we're facing something that requires more faith than we think we have to remember back of the, all the times that God has been faithful leading up to that time. Uh, that's not quite what he's doing here. He's standing it up and actually turns it into an altar because we see that he pours oil on it as a, as a sacrifice. And again, this desolate place at that time calls it the, the house of God superseding the, the name that was there uh, previously. And then uh, uh, he, uh, very interesting that he uh, has this whole expression, very concerned about uh, what's going on here. And his reaction includes making a vow. Uh, it's, he begins by saying that the if and the then, which, by the way, is not language of faith. Uh, <laughs> if God promises you something in his word and you say, okay, well, if you do this, then I'll do this. Of course, uh, it's just the people in the first service that do that. I'm just mentioning it to you <laughs> so you would be aware that some people do that, that uh, they get in these situations where, uh, yeah, God has said he's going to take care of us. God said he's always going to be with us. Uh, this, that uh, 
the, the gate of heaven, uh, the angels uh, and the latter are going with me too wherever I go. God's presence and his access are with us always through Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm just not quite sure about what the next couple of months hold. So therefore, Lord, if you'll do this and then uh, I'll do this. But um, one of the things that we got to give to Jacob is he at this point uh, is saying, I want more than just uh, a belief system. Notice that he says, if you do this and I come back and you do all, everything you said, you're going to be my God. It makes it very personal. And it's, it's one of these first statements we have about this idea of uh, uh, God having a personal relationship uh, with someone. And we see it here with Jacob, you know, again, of all, of all people. But again, uh, grace is truly amazing. It's certainly Jacob's only hope of how he's going to uh, get back home once again. But, uh, and again, it's that uh, hope and grace that uh, we want to fill our lives as well. Let's look at John uh, chapter 1, verse 50, because this is the one, kind of, the, again, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Uh, and uh, this is where Jesus, um, in a sense, it's almost out of the blue, brings up this, this statement about this dream that Jacob has and the latter uh, going, to, going to heaven. Uh, John's began his, uh, his gospel, and he's kind of, one of the things he's framing in chapter 1 certainly is the deity of Christ. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the verse 14, he became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the one of only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So to understand the, the deity of Christ, and then he gets into this, how people come to faith in Christ, and he gives four examples of Peter and Andrew and so forth. And one of these guys is a young guy named Nathaniel. Uh, and Nathaniel is, uh, is going to be pictured here uh, reading the scriptures under a fig tree, which means he's a Messianic Jew. That means because the scriptures had declared when the Messiah comes and sets up his millennial kingdom, every man will have their own fig tree. Now, that doesn't really do much for me, but I, maybe if you're Jewish living in the Middle East, that'd be, be awesome. I'm pretty good with an avocado tree. I've got one of those, and man, I'm thrilled when that baby produces. Uh, we just wish I would pl also planted a mango tree when I, but, uh, you know, too late now, but uh, 30 years later. The, uh, but uh, these, he's under a, a fig tree, and he's reading the scriptures, which says, I believe the Messiah is coming, and I believe I'm going to have my fig tree. So it wasn't an unusual, it was, a, it was a statement of who he was at that time. He's living in anticipation of the Messiah coming. Somebody just needed to show up to him and go, uh, I know you're looking for the Messiah. By the way, he's just like right over there. And then he goes to talk to him. You know, there's people out there that are actually looking for the Messiah. They're looking for somebody to forgive them of their sins. They're looking for somebody to tell them that God loves them and what it means to have a relationship with them. And if you, if you can find that person, they're a really easy person to lead to the Lord because they're, they're, they're pretty much, uh, pretty much uh, ready. I was thinking of uh, uh, Jeff, who was a gunny that made this, uh, this pulpit. We came to know Jeff because he walked into the church on a Sunday morning, sat through a service, only guy in the church with a tie on, of course, and uh, never been to church before, but just, uh, he was from Texas, figured you'd probably wear a tie when you go to church. So he came in with his, uh, with his tie on, came up after the service and basically said, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> That's almost exactly what he said. And, uh, and then we got to hear his whole story. I prayed with him to receive the Lord, and he had, he had been a recruiter driving all over the country, and, uh, and everywhere he went through, it was on the mainland, through all these backwood places, uh, he, the only station he could find on the dial was CSN, Calvary Satellite Network at the time, and he kept hearing, hearing the gospel, hearing Bible teaching, and hearing about Calvary Chapels, which he had no idea what that was. But everywhere he went, and time and time again, this went on for over a year. And uh, his, uh, the only thing he could pick up was uh, CSN, and he'd listen, listen, and then when he finally got uh, done with that recruiting um, position, got stationed uh, over here to the Marine Base in Kaneohe, he, he, he did one of these, if and then. Well, Lord, if there is a Calvary Chapel near that Marine Base, then I will go. And if I go and they say, give me, tell me how to know you, I'm going to do it. So he gave the, it was a lot of faith, but it was an if and a then. 
And uh, he got transferred. He looked at, there's, I don't think there was a web in those days, but he looked in the phone book, found us, walked in. This is the Calvary Chapel next to the Marine base. What must I do to be saved? But there's a lot of people that could have led that guy to the Lord. He's like a Nathaniel. He was just waiting for someone to, to give him the news. And that's part of what John's doing here. But listen to what Jesus says as he kind of throws this in and back to our story with Jacob in verse 50. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Did you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the what? The Son of Man. The title that Jesus uses for himself as the Messiah uh, more, than, uh, more than any and pretty much uh, exclusively in John's gospel. So Jesus becomes the focus of, of the latter. Uh, and when he says, truly, truly, it's an Aramaic term. It means amen and amen. He uses it 25 times in John's gospel. And it's his way of basically saying, are you listening? <laughs> are you listening? Because I'm going to say something really important. And what he says is, I'm the ladder, and I'm the gate. Uh, so you can have access in God's presence by coming to me. And uh, that's what Jacob had with the promise from God, and that's what we have in a relationship with the Lord. We have direct access and God's presence wherever we go. God was saying to Jacob back then that uh, where you go, the ladder's going, the angels are going, and I'm going. And I'm going to bring you back into this land just the way I, I, I promised. You can make your then and if whatever deal's going on there, Jacob, but I, it's not going to affect me and what I'm going to do for you and my faithfulness uh, uh, and what you're all about. Aren't you glad that, uh, that uh, if you do this, then I'll do that kind of deals? You know, God's probably kind of chuckling over those things. I don't know if he chuckles or not, but, uh, you know, all, all these things that he's going to do for us anyway. You know, if you'll do this and I'll do this, I'm going to do that anyway. It doesn't really matter, you know. Uh, and, you know, but we just don't, we're still waiting for that. Uh, you better do something to make this team. <laughs> you know, we think that's what God's going to say uh, in those quiet times with him. But here in the New Testament, we find out that Jesus is the gate. He is the ladder. He's the one that's going to go with us wherever we go. Paul says this uh, about Jesus being that mediator for us in 1 Timothy 2.5. 2, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself is a ransom for, for all. The incarnate son of God is the one who, again, leaves heaven and comes down to die on a cross for our sins, rises again, sends his Holy Spirit so that his presence can literally go with us and lead us and guide us wherever, wherever we might, might go. But it's just, uh, uh, it's an interesting thing, the, the number of people that still, still don't really get the main concept of, of, of salvation in a relationship with God and still have a tendency to think that, that uh, it's really works and performance driven. Listen, we, we know the truth and I feel like I'm uh, playing a one string guitar up here. You know, I'm kind of giving you the grace thing all the time. Uh, and, you know, and I think uh, most of us are, are probably going, that's good because I, I pretty much need to probably hear that at least once a week to really get this, uh, uh, you know, woven, you know, into who I am and my spiritual being. Uh, a guy named Sky uh, Jathani was, uh, does a lot of stuff with young people. He was uh, meeting with a bunch of college kids who in particular had, were Christians, grown up in Christian homes um, and uh, were even in Christian colleges. Spent, a, spent uh, a bunch of time with them, asking them questions about their relationship with the Lord and how they were doing and so forth. And, and um, he was able to uh, get them to be pretty honest uh, about that. And most of them said what they believed about their relationship with the Lord is that God was very disappointed with them. And that's kind of what they carried around with them, uh, that God was pretty much probably very disappointed uh, with, with them. Uh, one student said, my parents were, were students at a Christian college in the 90s and a revival broke out. They were on fire for God. And here I am consumed uh, by sin day after day. And the other students, he said through tears, uh, shared how they believed also God must be very disappointed. Then he asked them, how many of you were raised in a Christian home? All the hands go up. Uh, how many of you, you know, uh, have, uh, were, were in youth groups and stuff in high school? All their hands went up. How many of you are in Christian colleges now? And all the hands went up. Uh, and then he said this, 
Uh, you've all spent uh, 18 or 20 years in the church. You've been taught the Bible from the time you could crawl, and you would uh, attend Christian colleges, but not one of you gave the right answer. Not one of you said in the midst of your sin that God still loves you. Yeah, we sin. But the predominant thing to realize is that even despite that, God still loves us. And then he concludes by saying, I didn't blame the students for their failure. Somewhere in their spiritual formation, they were taught either explicitly or implicitly that what mattered was not God's love for them, but how much they could accomplish for him. And I think that we should try to accomplish great things for God. But, but our relationship is based on his love for us and his faithfulness to us. And if we never accomplish anything for him, he still loves us and he'll still be faithful to us. And we see that in men like Abraham and men like Isaac. And you're going to get a kick out of Jacob by the time we get uh, done going through, through his life. He's, he's a piece of work. I mean, it's uh, amazing, this guy. And... Uh, he, he's, he is an interesting case study, to say, say the least. And for this, and, and you almost have to know a little bit of his shenanigans and what he's going to be up to, to appreciate this statement by God that shows up in the middle of uh, that certain place and says, oh, by the way, I'm God Almighty. And everything your dad said, it's true. You're the third patriarch. You're not looking like it right now. You're probably not believing it right now. I'm going with you wherever you go. I'm going to be faithful no matter what you're going through. I'm going to bring you right back here again, just like I promised. And, uh, and Jacob probably couldn't get over that. And, and we'll, we'll cut him the slack for doing the if and the then, you know, because we all have a tendency to, to do those things. But for us, we want to get beyond the if and the then and just, just believe and trust, trust the Lord and, and realize that, uh, yeah, I want to do things for the Lord because he loves me. Uh, it's not because I want to do them so he will love me. It, we, we get that backwards. And we need to be careful as much as we know it. We constantly, I think, need to see you know, Christianity and what God has for us lived out in, in flesh and blood and men like, like Jacob so we can really appreciate and understand God's love, all that he has for us. Amen. To give you my life. Your saving grace, your presence is my faithful, forever and true. The love you gave is the kind of love I want to give back to you. All of my thoughts. My desperate ways There's so much in my heart And I need you To make me faithful Lord, make me new The life you gave Is the kind of life I want to live Love you. 
all of my thoughts, my desperate way. And there's so much in my heart that I need you to make me faithful, to make me new. Why don't we all stand the life you gave?
standing in liberty We gotta hold fast to faith The fellowship of the suffering Is our power, it is our strength Follow through the fire Through the valley, through the storm Home the the Lord together. Praise you, Lord Jesus. You are 